Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q1 FY24 earnings conference call of Apar Industries Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode. And there will be no opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ambish Tabari from S. Angel Technologies. Thank you and over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ambish Tiwari from S. Angel Technologies. I welcome you all to the Q1 FY24 earnings call for Apar Industries. To discuss the business performance and outlook, we have from the management side Mr. Kushal Desai, Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Chetanya Desai, Managing Director, and the CFO Mr. Ramesh Ayer. I would now pass on to Mr. Kushal Desai for opening remarks. Thank you and over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Ambesh. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Apar Industries Q1 FY24 earnings call. Uh, let me begin by giving you an overview of our performance and then I will follow that up with a short industry update. Post that we can get into more uh, detailed segmental performance of the three businesses. So during Q1 FY24, the consolidated revenue came in at uh, INR 3773 crores which is 22% above the same period previous year. We witnessed an overall volume growth across all our three divisions, both in the domestic market as well as overseas. Our exports grew by 53% year on year and coincidentally contributes to 53% of the overall revenue of the company compared to 42% from a year ago. The EBITDA is higher by 54% at uh, 369 crores. Uh, at a margin of 9.8%. Profit after tax came in at 197 crores, which is 61% higher than in the same period previous year and is at 5.2% versus 4% in the year ago period. In terms of some industry highlights, according to the Central Electricity Authority, um, the data that they published on their website, India has added 14,625 circuit kilometers of transmission line in FY23. Um, in the first quarter of FY24, further 2,796 circuit kilometers of transmission lines were added. By FY24-25, a total of 28,700 circuit kilometers of transmission lines are expected to be added making a total reach of about 4.5 lakh circuit kilometers. This expansion initiative is part of the Prime Minister's Gati Shakti Master Plan which aims to enhance and strengthen India's power transmission infrastructure. A uh, record high investment of 75,500 crores approximately of transmission line projects has been approved by the centre and these will be awarded under the competitive bidding route. These projects are basically expected to connect the renewable energy zones that are being set up in Gujarat, Rajasthan, Maharashtra and hydropower projects in Himachal Pradesh. The Ministry of New and Renewable Energy has a target of awarding 50 gigawatts per annum of renewable energy capacity including 10 gigawatts per annum from wind energy between the years 2024 and 2028. Our belief is that even a portion of these aggressive plans get executed, the demand for conductors, cables and transformer oil will all remain strong. Coming to the more specific individual business highlights, the conductor business revenue in the first quarter 24 grew by 15% year on year to reach uh, 1,774 crores with a volume growth of 27%. The export revenue grew by 58% year on year, contributing towards 57% of the division's revenues. The uh, premium product basket contributed to 42% of the revenue mix, 
the e build up a metric ton post forex adjustment came in at 38740 rupees per ton uh overall our order book remains reasonably robust at 5356 crores the conventional acsr conductor in the tariff based competitive bidding for the domestic market has now been upgraded to an al59 which is a high efficiency conductor so this is a very positive development for the country as there are significant advantages of using the al59 conductor type over acsr and is representative is representative of the premiumization direction that the country is going in we are also seeing a gradual shift worldwide to an increased usage of specialized slash acc type conductor um as customers are building more robust and higher capacity transmission system to evacuate power especially from the renewable power source coming to the performance of the oil division in the first quarter of fy24 revenues came in at 1198 crores which is up 13% year on year the volume growth was also 13% in the quarter and this has been an all time high volume sales for the first quarter of any year exports contributed to approximately 50% of revenues the ebida post forex adjustment came in at 6035 rupees per kl which is lower than uh, last year due to a higher uh, base in the last year of uh, q1 but is in line with the guidance which we have been giving the uh, lubricants revenue came in at 241 crores with a volume of about 17 and a half thousand kiloliters we expect that transformer oil and industrial oil which saw an increased demand in the quarter will continue to uh, show increase through the rest of the year the retail automotive and the agricultural lubricants demand was a bit subdued in the first quarter coming to our cable business the cable business revenues grew by 52% in the first quarter to reach 967 crores with an increase coming from our elastomeric products as well as our exports our exports contributed to a 52% of sales in q1 versus 43% a year ago the ebida margins post forex came in at rupees 110 crores which is 11.4% of revenues up from by 3.8% compared to the previous uh, period all the sub verticals within the cable business have shown uh, positive growth including our b2c part of the business which is the anushakti uh, house wire so in conclusion i'd like to say that we had a positive start to fy24 with volume led growth across all divisions however in the short term we expect a bit of a slowdown in the export markets as there is a clear sign and signal of the inventorization of excess inventories especially in the united states and to some extent in europe warehouses of many customers are full um, and they are reducing inventory considering that the supply chains have normalized and there is no need to hold higher inventory levels to compensate for uncertainty in uh, deliveries which are now available with significantly reduced lead time and with a much higher level of predictability along the uh, delivery supply chain there is also some effect of the higher interest rates which has increased the carrying cost of inventory and that is also partly contributing towards uh, this effect um there are also some large projects especially in the united states that could be pushed back to allow for the widespread expectation of interest rates to come off in the next 12 to 18 months thereby allowing the total cost of the project to reduce for some of the developers however our discussions with various epc players customers and asset developers indicates that even if there is some some delay the building of these renewable energy projects transmission lines or other infrastructure are all on a uh, stream and will happen this could consequently affect demand in the in the short term 
especially in the US market. However, the domestic Indian market remains very robust and as mentioned in my opening remarks, there are several projects which have been bid and will be under execution. We continue to be focused on the long term prospects of the company and remain committed to not only service the domestic market but also increase actively our global customer presence thereby creating what we believe would be the best value for our stakeholders. We have a very detailed corporate presentation that has been uploaded on the company's uh, website um, and we, I would encourage uh, all of you to please uh, look at the same as it carries much more information than what is possible to put forth um, you know, in these opening remarks. So with this I'd like to come to the end of my comments. I thank all of you for joining um, our call today and with this uh, could we open up the floor to questions please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question, may please press star in one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself in the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants request a use handset while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is on the line of Ankur Jain from Future Investments Private Limited. Please go ahead. Well, hi sir, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so I have a question with respect to um, the polymer division. So recently um, you mentioned in your annual report that uh, the product Apaprene was approved by Hasbro, the world's largest toy company. So what is the revenue potential do you see in this business and uh, the overall growth in the polymer division? So that is my first question. And second question is in respect to the cable B2C business that we have. We are kind of late entrants in this business. Uh, now we have around 2,000 retail touch points as compared to a competitor like uh, uh, Polycab who has 2.5 lakh touch points. So wanted to know like what is the way forward for this business and um, uh, like our products are better than competition in terms of quality and price tag. Thank you. So for the first question, uh, Polymer business um, uh, is uh, relatively small to be compared to the other three businesses. And uh, our recent uh, approval with Hashpro um, will also open up, uh, you know, doors for other toy companies everywhere in the world. And we see this business growing. Uh, the polymer business currently is uh, about 100 crores uh, revenue per annum. And over a period of time with these approvals, we hope to get to 200 to 300 crores. We are making certain investments also in this polymer business, which is quite synergistic to our cable uh, business. Yeah, and uh, your second question was with respect to the B2C side. So yes, we are late mm -hmm. entrants, but as, I, as we mentioned before, we have a very unique uh, product. Um, our uh, distributor network is uh, constantly growing. Our retail presence is growing. and. Our whole focus has really been uh, on educating electricians, contractors and uh, specifiers. So the level of uh, demos and, and needs that we have in uh, the first quarter is about 60% of the 50 to 60% of the needs that we've had in the entire last year. So it's a gradual process of building brick by brick and you know we don't want to buy business, we want to grow the business. Uh, organically and in a systematic manner because the product is a premium product. But if you see the growth uh, trajectory has been very steady and we expect uh, it to continue over the next few years. So besides the Anushakti wires, you know, we are also look, selling through a distribution network a whole range of uh, light duty, light duty cables, but Anushakti is our flagship product. So what like aspiration we have in this business in the say like uh, five years on the line? So I mean, uh, I think I've mentioned in, in, in some of the previous calls that uh, we can see clear visibility of getting to about uh, 500 crores um, 
you know, in uh, 20 in uh, FI 26. So mm -hmm. uh, the business has been growing. Uh, right now, it's been almost increasing 50 to 70 percent a year. As the base number grows, you know, the percentage may fall, but you'll keep adding uh, significantly. And wherever we are able to demo the product, uh, especially in front of decision makers, we have a very high probability that they go in for the buyer because of its property. Yeah, okay. Uh, I just reading one more question. Um, we also you know, have the wiring part. Uh, to two questions and you can probably, if you don't mind, come back in the question queue so that we can, you know, address everybody else's questions also, yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is from the line of Amit Anwani from Prabhuda Sri Ladar. Please go ahead. Hi, so thanks for taking my question. Uh, my first question is on the conductor's business. Uh, you highlighted two things in your opening remark. One was export slowdown, uh, which can be sensed in the short term. And at the same time, you also highlighted uh, uh, move towards minimization with ACSR. So I wanted to understand two things. Are we now, since export is the largest contributor, sticking to our guidance of 10% volume? And uh, are we also... Uh, saw realization dipping by 10%. So any sense on what we are expecting? Are we changing our stance uh, in conductors' business? And second, this ACSR opportunity, how that is going to pan out for us? What is the addressable market? Any uh, color you can throw on that? So we are not uh, changing our guidance on on all the three divisions. And conductor, we continue to hold a volume growth of, of about 10% uh, in terms of volume. And in terms of EBITDA, we expect it to be in the range of 25,000 per metric ton plus the tailwinds uh, that uh, that we get uh, on a quarter on quarter basis. Uh, uh, because uh, these uh, these orders are something that we get in domestic business as well as in export business. As mentioned, the opening remarks, uh, the, the domestic business is quite robust and strong, and uh, we don't expect a, uh, a reduction in, in the volume at this stage. Also, in terms of profitability, uh, uh, we have been uh, giving this guidance earlier also that uh, we look at 25,000 per metric ton and this quarter we had about 38,000 per metric ton, which is in line with our guidance. Right. My second question is on the cables business. So cables, uh, as you uh, spoke about the invent, uh, inventorization happening uh, across supply chain. Uh, there, what is the utilization or capex uh, trajectory which we mentioned? Uh, any color on that? And if you could just highlight the breakup within cables, which, uh, as we are already aware, that electromagnetic is growing much faster. Uh, any color on other divisions as well uh, within cables? If you would like to highlight, like power cables, XLP. Yeah. So even cables, our capex guidance continues. So what we mentioned in the last quarter. Overall our capex for this year for the next 12 to 18 months are likely to be about 350 to 400 crore. About two thirds is going to be on cable and uh, that is unchanged. Uh, we are not changing any of our guidance now because we believe the long term uh, uh, growth prospects is, is very much on the card. Uh, it's just a temporary momentum may uh, there could be some slight slippages on that front but the long term looks uh, very promising and therefore the CAPEX plan uh, remains unchanged as of now. Right. For premium product contribution, did we saw any slowdown? I can see 42% versus 47% YOY and HEC is uh, just 20% versus 26% YOY? Yeah, so, you know, it, uh, quarter on quarter these percentages vary. It's very difficult to put that on a quarter on quarter basis. Typically, we look at the entire 12 month period. So. These depends on the orders that we execute during the period and in our business there is a lot of testing requirements and approvals in place. So depending on the execution, this mixed percentage just can keep on changing on a quarter on quarter basis. Right. So and as you mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, you know the premiumization drive is uh, generally taking place across the board. So you know as you start uh, moving in time, 
like for example ACSR is now all the new bidding is coming with AL59 so in a year's time you will see a dramatic change in the domestic market on major transmission projects where AL59 as a conductor will become the base product so is it fair to assume that domestic market can deliver higher volume growth over next 2 3 years versus exports we are very flexible in terms of uh, you know wherever the we look at the uh, domestic and the export market actually as just one market where uh, wherever we get the best uh, realization uh, carrying the least amount of risk that's where we would where we would like to uh, to focus but our sense is that over the next 1 2 3 years the mix is not going to vary uh, very much because there is a lot of work that's happening overseas um it just the us market which uh, for conductors has uh, shown some amount of slow down there are all other markets also where uh, there is a demand that's coming up even from latin america from australia from many other geographies but you know we thought it would be prudent to mention and i think this is affecting all industries is not just um, you know our conductor and cable industry where the inventory levels that people were holding they are finding today that those levels are too high because supply chains have got uh, pretty much normalized and uh, capacities which were in place but not being effectively utilized uh, by manufacturers because of their own supply chain issues so those also have got sorted out so you know lead times and delivery times are much shorter than what they were you know during the covid period plus there is no uncertainty today in terms of calling up containers loading them on ships clearing them through ports etc so it's a very natural the inventorization uh, you know process that's taking place thank you sir and all the best yeah thank you thank you the next question is on the line of molik patel from equity security please go ahead yeah thanks for the opportunity a uh, couple of questions uh, in the last 2 3 years the export in cable business has been very very strong and it it has gone from let's like, say 20 25% of the cable top line to now it's almost 50% plus top line is it because of 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 uh, our relationship uh, with in a cable sorry in relationship in conductor and tso segments are opening this product to the same customers or is there something else which has been driving uh, this, this this growth so there are there is a combination of two uh, two things at play there are a few customers who are common in terms of conductors and cables especially the the very large epc companies that mm-hmm. have a division that builds transmission lines as well as um, you know these renewable energy uh, sort of supply and uh, erection at renewable energy sites so there is one group of those customers but there are many customers who we have opened up you know for supply of both conductors and cable who are in utility we are looking at at that aspect also so you can't take away from the synergy value of both you know the conductor and uh, and cable though you know the two sales teams you know they collaborate with each other but they call on customers uh, individually got 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 it uh, second question is on the eso segment the volume growth has been strong and you mentioned in your opening remark that uh, because of the various government initiatives the demand wari wari world ki baat hai the domestic demand across uh, 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 conductor uh, tso and cable has been good so uh, uh, is there anything else which has been driving the growth any more new we understand that uh, the government and ऐसी बिजनेस स्टार्टेड प्रोक्योरिंग मोर ट्रांसफॉर्मर्स दैट इज दैट शुड बी द वन ड्राइवर बट एनीथिंग एल्स व्हिच यू मे लाइक टू हाइलाइट देयर आर टू मेजर स्कीम्स व्हिच आर देयर वन इज द वन इज द यू नो आरडीएसएस व्हिच वी हैव स्पोकन अबाउट इन द लास्ट कॉल वेयर देयर इज अ रोल आउट टेकिंग प्लेस फॉर यू नो द रूरल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन यू नो स्ट्रेंथनिंग दैट इज गोइंग ऑन देयर द केबल बिजनेस विल बेनिफिट मोर द पावर केबल साइड um as far as this uh, uh, you know this gati shakti is concerned it is a transmission line initiative of building transmission lines connecting all these different green uh, sites and the third effect which is there is that these green sites are coming up 
with uh, you know increased combination of wind and solar um, and both of them have a, a reasonable intensity of cables. So you see all of these uh, you know they are all drivers and the similar effects are there you know in the overseas market shows where you've got new transmission lines being built you've got uh, uh, both wind and uh, and solar projects running and in every case there is some requirement of transformer oil because there is a a uh, substation that is involved which carries a transformer. So that is the reason why in the opening remarks I did mention that over the next 3-4 years you know we should see uh, a, a good demand coming forward for transformer oils also on a global basis. Mr. Bookkeeping question, what has been our acceptance for this quarter? So our interest bearing uh, in C outstanding is about 3,700 crores as of June. That was 4,100 crores sometimes in the end of March, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. We we'll come back again. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Charanjit Singh from DSP. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on good set of numbers. So my first question is, you have talked about some weakness in the US market. Uh, so do you think that some of the other markets which you have talked about, uh, like you know, LATAM and Europe, they will be able to compensate for that in the near term? And when do you see that the US markets can come back again? Because earlier you had highlighted there are large mega projects which are going on in terms of the uh, power infrastructure in US and that could create uh, some more longer term sustainable demand. So, if you can touch upon this aspect. Yeah, so um, uh, there is a, you know, a similar effect is there even in Europe as in the United States where there is a, a you know, higher uh, inventory levels in place. So, most customers are talking about, you know, a three to four month uh, period where, um, you know, ordering will be at a, a slower pace. They're pretty much, it's not that there is no ordering, there's ordering to cover up for uh, making sure that the mix of products is uh, is appropriate. But you know that the, the free flow of demand should probably pick up, you know, in the next, uh, meaning at the end of this quarter, uh, a three to four month sort of uh, time frame. In terms of the mega projects and some of the larger projects that are concerned, as I mentioned earlier, none of them have been uh, stalled. There is a widespread expectation that, you know, interest rates are uh, now peaking and uh, there could be a likelihood that in the next 6 to 12 months, you know, the rates will actually start uh, maybe coming down. And uh, there are some developers who are, uh, you know, contemplating that and as a consequence looking at, uh, you know, deferring their projects. But you know, I don't think that it is a matter of serious worry for us simply because of the number of project sites, you know, all over the world which are uh, actively coming up. So you know, if a developer was looking at wanting to develop three sites, they may focus on one or two sites and then defer the third site. So overall, I think we will still see a good demand uh, overseas. And on the domestic side, so there is none of that effect because most of it is based on um, you know, the government approving transmission lines for the green corridors that are coming up as well as um, SECI and the Ministry of Renewable Energy approving uh, or, you know, approving tenders to go out for uh, solar and wind farm. So overall, you know, uh, Charanjit, I don't see any huge concern. You know, there may be a few months, a little bit here or there, but you know, given the nature of the business, which is a bit long cycle, the long cycle is still pretty much intact. You know, the medium, the medium term, long term is uh, is very much strong, and in fact, looking stronger by the day, given the amount of uh, commitments which people are looking at putting forward. You know, in terms of uh, executing uh, down this path, I must also mention here that in some of the tenders which we are filling in for conductors. Already, um, customers are asking for the carbon footprint. So, uh, they're not only asking for your scope one, scope two, but also the embedded carbon footprint. You know, part of scope three, which is in terms of 
uh, what is the carbon content of you know the aluminum that you are sorting etc so this whole esg movement is really here to stay and uh, as long as that continues in this manner there will only be an acceleration of <coughs> um, you know uh, execution like for example if you see the power mix in india it has improved from almost 78 79% uh, hydrocarbon based down to about 71% hydrocarbon based and if this execution continues will be in the mid 60s in another couple of years so i hope that kind of gives you an overall view of you know the question that you asked yes sir yes, sir so that's that's very helpful and thanks for the detailed answer so my other question is on the you know transformer oil uh, part of the business uh, when we are looking at you know most of the transformer manufacturers the outlook from their side is pretty strong and they are you know adding significant uh, capacities so in a way then uh, do you expect this transformer oil segment also in terms of volume growth can be much higher then generally single digit growth what we have seen with the kind of outlook which transformer manufacturers have so we expect that the volume growth should definitely take place um and uh, you know the 5% growth that we are projecting is for the entire basket of products as i mentioned in my opening remarks that of that transformer oil and our industrial lubricants are probably the two categories where we are the most bullish in terms of growth so essentially a uh, moment you have a, a solar farm or a wind farm that comes up there is a substation that is required then you know to uh, step up the power onto a transmission line and then at the other end another substation is required to step it down for you know the distribution to take place so with this activity that's happening here the uh, the the collateral uh, benefit is going to come to the transformer oil side and we still maintain uh, 40 plus percent market share in the domestic market we are by far the largest exporter from india on the transformer oil side so that part of the business will continue to grow right sir uh, thanks for taking my answer i'll circle back and thank you thank you the next question is from the line of dhananjay bagrodia from afk please go ahead Hi sir, congratulations on a great set of numbers again. I uh, wanted to understand regarding your realization for the year for the segment. How do you see that playing along? So the realization is actually a function of uh, multiple factors, and it depends on the you know the price of aluminium, copper. Uh, it also depends on the price of the base oil that happens. Uh, we typically look at margin and also look at you know premium products and uh, export products. uh in terms to drive the per unit of profitability so you know your realization will depend on on the orders and you know there are multiple factors that de- decide the realization level so, for example our realization is it is it booked now let's say for the like that's a contract order is it is it a, is it variable or is it fixed and b is there pass through and then c regarding that do our ob pattern accordingly fluctuate or is it more in a, a band when we do our contracts so no, 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 i'm sorry go ahead so it's a it's a combination of both variable and fixed you now we we have all kinds of orders that come through and aluminum and copper are complete pass through uh, we complete we take a back to back hedging for both the conductor and cable business uh, in the case of oil uh, uh, it cannot be hedged so we keep inventory of about two months and uh, uh, to some extent we have sometimes we have inventory gains some quarter we have inventory losses which uh, averages out over a long period of time and your op pattern is that always in a band or how, how does that usually fluctuate sorry what is that so your op pattern for your op per unit how would that play along so we we try to yeah. control the operating uh, okay. or the ebitda so in fact we go above that we try to control the value addition that we have or the gross margin on okay. the product and uh, as ramesh says the aluminum and uh, copper are pass throughs So if it's a variable, we would buy on the index as part of the variable, and if huh. it's fixed, then we take the LME position. Okay, so no relation on <coughs> on any of the metals. Okay, so that way our OP pattern would be broad base would be uh, consistently in the same range. We won't have too much fluctuations like maybe some other. Uh, so variation is based only on your competitive intensity for that particular product based on what the order has come in. um okay. so as you get into more premium products you have more pricing power as you 
have uh, more commodity products, then the competitive levels are uh, higher okay. uh, in nature. So you could have a fluctuation in the operating margin, but it's not caused by generally a huge fluctuation in the basic uh, metals because those are uh, either variable or they are hedged on a fixed price. Okay. That makes sense. And yeah. your question, uh, you know, as Ramesh has tried to answer that question in terms of, um, you know, uh, the, the revenue will depend upon which direction, you know, aluminum and of copper course. moves in. So off late, sure. we've seen commodities uh, sort of strengthening a little bit, especially yes. the uh, crude and uh, and gas oil. Yeah. So in that case, with a, with a lag of a couple of months, it pretty much gets passed on into the market. Okay. Generally, when there's an increase, then we tend to gain. When there is a decrease, then prices tend to fall a little uh, sooner because customers get overly anxious to negotiate down. Um, but overall, you know, we don't see a very uh, a complex environment on commodities. You know, whatever movements are there, they'll be flattish or they will be gradual. Okay. That, that's our sense. Sure, that's it. Uh, one question regarding competitive intensity. Uh, see, since our factories now might be running at higher uh, utilization, so we're able to pass on some of the cost advantages. Uh, anything along the lines of what's happening globally in terms of competitive intensity? So globally, uh, the competitive intensity has increased. In, in the last uh, earnings call also, I mentioned that you know China... Um, a lot of supply related issues in China also have got straightened out just like the rest of the world because these COVID effects are, are behind us. Um, so the competitive intensity has uh, has increased and that is the reason why, you know, we have been uh, talking about a guidance on conductors of, you know, 25,000 uh, per ton from a higher level that existed uh, last year. Sure. But uh, having said that, you know, we are quite confident that we will be able to, to live up to whatever guidances we have given. Sure, Thank you so much. I'll come back. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ria Mehta from Equitas Investments. Please go ahead. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, my question is basically based on the and the cable division. So we are seeing a sequential decline in the cable order book. So uh, where is this coming from and could you write us in the pipeline for the same? So, you know, the, in the cable business, uh, you know, the order book is not as critical as in the uh, conductor business because the conductor business is a much longer cycle than cable where there is a lot of inquiries and, you know, transaction flow that's taking place. What we are seeing today is that uh, uh, the orders coming from the United States have slowed down and as I mentioned, will be a, a, a soft for the next a uh, few months until you know inventory levels start uh, start straightening out. Um, against that, the offtake in the domestic side has been stronger, and then the order cycle is much shorter. You know, you get an order and you start execute, executing within days of getting the order. So, the order book, I don't think on the on the cable side actually is a, a measure of uh, uh, you know of of that. Um, having said that, uh, uh, you know, we, we do have um, an order book of almost a thousand crores. Right. And so it's covering at least one quarter worth of uh, worth of sales. How much will we export in this cable order book? About the 50% would be exports. And uh, in terms of margins, uh, should we expect further decline in the margins considering that the export percentage would go down and domestic would increase in the cable yeah. division? Yeah, so we are guiding a margin of 10 to 12 percentage, uh, which should be around that, uh, that level. Okay. In terms of oil division, uh, since we are seeing crude going up tad bit uh, on a fortnightly basis, uh, how does this impact our uh, margin? So this will actually happen uh, over a period of time because you know depends on what inventory you are carrying. In the short term, usually when prices go up, you know there is a, a benefit that uh, that takes place because what when you buy your base oils on a contract basis, then the contract formula takes it's a backward looking formula. So you get a breather in terms of time, you know, before it comes and hits uh, you. 
one of the reverse cycle, you know, when prices come down, the reverse happens where the contract formula takes uh, the same amount of time longer for it to come down. So that's why Ramesh has been saying that, you know, up and down it kind of negates each other. But this cycle, if prices go up, then you tend to benefit at least in the short term. Got it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanmai. I'll join back with you yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pratikha Daftari from Equitas Investments. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Just wanted to understand the order book for uh, the conductor division. Uh, this would be for six months? Yes, so typically it ranges about uh, six to seven months. Of course, there are still some, uh, some orders within that order book wherein the exhibition time happens over a period of one year also. So, otherwise, generally it's about uh, six to seven months, uh, with the exception of few orders having long execution period. Okay, and what would be the contribution of value-added products, uh, specifically HEC and uh, OPGW, in this uh, order book? Uh, so, uh, it's about uh, just one. Second. It's about forty-five percentage. Both put together. Yeah, the premium products that we call. These could be about 45% of the order book. Okay. And this, uh, you know, the whole uh, idea of uh, basically restocking or lesser demand or, uh, that we are seeing, that would be predominantly or completely in export market, right? How do we look at uh, order pipeline in uh, domestic market? So, you know, Pratiksha, the domestic side, see, even in the export side, uh, you know, the PV cable, the solar and PV, etc., the demand uh, still fundamentally remains strong. It's just a de-stocking where people realize that they don't need to carry that level of inventory anymore, you know, for for servicing their project size. The domestic size, the demand has been strong. The competitive intensity is a bit higher uh, than in exports because in exports, you need a lot of approval. Uh, especially if you want to ex export to the United States, you need a UL approval. If you want to export to um, Europe, you need a, a CE or a VDE approval. Uh, the domestic market is a bit more open and more competitive. But, you know, we are finding that not only power cables, but demand has been growing for wind and, you know, some of the more uh, specialty cables also. So, I think as uh, Ramesh has mentioned that we are looking at a 25 to 30 percent growth for the business as a whole and a, uh, a, a, an EBITDA guidance of, you know, between 10 and 12 percent. Okay. And just one last question. You know, you mentioned Bati Shakti and you mentioned uh, RDSs as uh, policies. That are, how do you look at Bharat Net as an opportunity for the, uh, our product? So, Bharat Net is also an opportunity uh, for our uh, optical fiber side of the business. And, uh, but you know, some of that is just still getting crystallized in terms of how the, it's very clear that there is a huge, you know, about 35,000 uh, crores worth of uh, turnkey projects that are going to come on stream for Bharat Net. But the modalities of, uh, you know, how it will be executed is still uh, not completely finalized. And that should come out in the, in the next few weeks. But that opportunity is absolutely there. Okay. But that will be again uh, in competition intensive, right? Well, if it's on a turnkey basis, yeah, it will be. But then, um, you know, if each package is uh, two to 3,000 crores and it generally entails uh, about 10% of uh, cables and then uh, the remaining 90% is accessories, right of way, digging, you know, all these other aspects. Uh, but the ticket size of each will be over 2,000 crores, e two to 3,000 crores each package. So the competitive intensity is there, but it cannot be that high because the the players only with with a requisite balance sheet would be in a position to bid for that business. Yes. You need to provide bank guarantees and you know all these other things, uh, which are not the easiest to come by. Oh. And besides yeah. that, we see uh, also, you know, as the 5G rollouts, right now you don't see a big amount of 5G rollouts, but around the world, 5G rollouts are starting to take place, hmm. where you have a combination of fiber optic and copper, because the uh, pipelines which are laid, it's much faster to lay, you don't have to lay a separate fiber optic line and a separate power line. 
So when you when you have the combination in a single cable, you end up cutting your laying cost by half. And they play a significant role in the US and some of these other markets. So that's another area which we are looking at. Um, you know, various products are under testing, approval, etc. On the fiber optic and power side. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kishan Toshniwal from Polar Ventures LLP. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Congratulations and great set of numbers. I have a one question that as you mentioned that in the conductor division, the premium conductors will become the new norm or the new normal. So why are we guiding for 25,000 rupee a bit of a, a realization? When we are seeing that uh, the premium products will become the new normal, then why so low guidance on uh, realization of uh, conductors? So typically, ACSR conductors carried guidance for decades, which were you know in the eight thousand, nine thousand, ten thousand rupees per ton, and so then uh, getting to twenty five thousand uh, plus is a is a good step up, um, you know, to that. So um, our expectation is that it should be in that in that range. This move is a relatively new move it, uh, of uh, CA having approved uh, this AL59, um, which is one of the high efficiency uh, conductors in there. And so you know over a period of time, uh, uh, we'll be able to determine exactly where uh, you know that that margin level will fall. Because today there are five, six major players who can do AL59 versus about 30, 35 players who would have uh, bid against uh, ACSR, you know, sort of uh, contract or tender. Uh, I'm sure some of those 30 players who don't make this cable will also try to make, uh, sorry, conductor will try to make this conductor. But uh, uh, all I can say is that it's in the positive direction. So in continuation to that, in the last con call, you were guiding in the range of 25 to 30,000. Now you are saying 25,000 plus, but now you are not saying 25 to 30,000, that range can be maintained. So we, we were very, we've always guided 25,000 plus any tailwind effects which are there. Um, and those tailwind effects do happen, you know, where you've got sometimes more favorable freight, sometimes you've got, uh, you know, certain... Um, execution that happens uh, sooner and faster than had been anticipated. But we've not changed our guidance. It's still remaining at 25,000 uh, plus, uh, you know, any tailwinds that actually come by. And, you know, as you go quarter by quarter, some of the freight benefits and all will obviously level itself out. So you'll be done then down to the basic intrinsic strength of the margins on the underlying products. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Himanshu Upadhyay from O3 PMS. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, congrats on good set of results. Am I audible? Yes, yes. We can hear you. Yeah. See, yeah, I in the starting of the uh, thing, we stated that the slowdown we are seeing or expecting in conductor uh, is there in the expo do you expect that similar slowdown can also come in the cables business because both are the end markets would be similar okay and even on the tso and should not this slowdown be for the all the segments means why only conductors any thoughts of, of yours on that yeah, so as i mentioned that uh, there is an effect uh, you know on both cables and conductors and it's an effect that's happening across almost every product line that's being exported to the United States. Um, because they were all holding higher inventory levels due to all the uncertainties um, and lead times for delivery. As those start normalizing, it's natural that, you know, the deliveries, uh, I meaning the inventory levels fall. And today, especially with the high interest rates, the cost of carrying higher inventory is also a big burden. So that is also catalyzing some level of the inventorization. So we are seeing it in, in, in both product categories. Fortunately, the domestic demand um, has been uh, quite robust. So that's the reason why we're not changing guidance really for the, for the year. 
Okay. You may have a, a temporary fall in exports as a percentage of total revenues, but you know, in the once this process in the next few months gets settled, you will find the demand in both the sectors, both domestic as well as export, uh, continuing to be quite strong. And the cables export should be majorly, predominantly to US only. So the US is the largest uh, export uh, market that we have. Um, but we are seeing a good demand from Australia and uh, uh, we have some amount of demand coming and growing even from Europe. There are projects that are still continuing in Africa which are uh, African Development World Bank aided. So it, you know, it, uh, the, we, we export product to multiple countries around the world. So even though the US is the largest and there is a bit of a, a, a temporary slowdown over there, we expect uh, uh, you know, overall the market to still be uh, good, the export market to still be good. And other geographies are starting to pick up. Okay. And one last thing, uh, the transformer oils or the oils business, uh, we have, do you think the numbers are sustainable and the market has, uh, the pressures of uh, high priced inventory and all those are now far behind and that 6,000 rupees is the sustainable on so I think uh, uh, 6,000 rupees per KL, I mean, you know, uh, we've guided at 5,500 a KL for the year. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, as you run through the remaining three quarters, we should be able to, as things look today, we should be able to uh, reach those numbers. Okay. okay. Thank you from yes. my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Fujal from Girik Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear us? Uh, the line for the current participant has dropped off. We'll move to the next. That is from the line of Vishal Kedia, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Vishal, please go ahead. So, how much exports are contributed from US in conductors and cable segment? Which conductors you say? How much so, exports are contributed from US in conductors and cable segments? What is the percentage of US? Uh, out of a total exports, uh, total cable quarter sales, US would be about 25 to 28 percentage total sales. Hello. Yes, should you? Any other questions, Vishal? And, and in the cable segment, sir? Cable is what I mentioned. Cable is around 28%. Uh, and the conductors? Total sales. Yeah. And in the case yeah. of conductors, it is uh, also in the 20s. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pavan Nahas, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Thank you, gentlemen. Once again, congratulations. My question is, we have a very robust order book for conductors, more than three quarters of current quarter revenue. Uh, so we would have a good sense how many more quarters the tailwind on spreads are likely to continue. So if you can talk a little about that. One quarter, two quarter, three quarters. Yes, so some of uh, the orders Pavan uh, is, you know, the execution happens over a period of time. It is not that all these orders come on a first in first out basis. We get these orders and some of the orders execution in fact can even start one year down the line. So what is reflected here is the entire order book uh, that we have as of now. But the bulk of, I would say 75%, 80% of these orders are to be executed over the next 6 to 7, six to seven months. And uh, as Ramesh had mentioned earlier, there is a few which actually run longer. Our sense is that within this period, you know, you, there will be new orders which will come up. So it's a completely moving, it's a moving uh, number. Yeah. yeah, it's a moving number. So if you take the US market, Pawan, you know, there are a, a, a bunch of utilities, almost about 30 utilities which are very large utilities. There are 3,000 utilities which are much smaller utilities. So those smaller utilities for their uh, 
maintenance and capex requirements they uh, rely on distributors now these distributors have high level of stock so as this uh, you know as their stock depletes over the next 3 to 4 months they will come back into the into the market to uh, to stock and carry the stock level will not go up to the levels that they were because they don't need to but then the demand flow will start coming based on you know the way the execution is happening for the larger utilities um uh, they have now been you know they moved towards uh, you know direct purchases and even they are uh, reducing their uh, stock levels because they don't need to carry as much stock so our sense is that the uh, most of this deinventorization process will be a 3 to 4 month process it's not going to be uh, like a one year sort of situation um i had also mentioned that there are a certain uh, big asset aggregators that are there like we have even in in india a few so some of them if they've got multiple projects running they are reducing the number of simultaneous projects that they are executing today waiting to uh, uh, deferring a few projects since the interest rates may come down so they are concentrating on accelerating a certain set of projects and slowing down some others so as far as final demand equation is concerned we don't see any huge uh, you know impact or change taking place because you mentioned the demand side actually i want to say congratulations for me because i've been watching you all over a decade i mean us is 20% plus of our conductor business that's like huge i i'm sorry i missed it and cable it is more than 25% so that is so sooner or later they'll come back but my question was more on the spread side that you know we are saying conductor 25000 is the normal plus the tailwind so my what i'm saying is we have a certain amount of order book we know what will be executed in the next two three quarters so for how many more quarters can we expect this tailwind to continue before it goes to 25000 that's the question so, so you will find uh, you will find that uh, you know that the, the you know the tailwind is the velocity of that is reducing because as you uh execute orders or you carry a higher freight than you know the current freight etc as the execution is getting done you're monetizing that and the new orders that are coming in are more in line with you know current uh, current freight and current uh, cost structures which are in place so um, our sense is that you will finally get to that 25000 level the tailwind also comes not only from freight and things but also on the product mix so there are a whole lot of uh, you know projects which have been bid upon and then you know as they get fructified then you know you could have the mix uh, altering on a positive side but otherwise considering all factors you know 25000 is what uh, we had uh, thrown up as uh, a long term sustainable number this is like i understand that long term 25000 which is amazing all i'm saying is we have a certain amount of order book we will have some sense about next two quarters right so so can we like you know all i'm trying to get to is incremental understood 25000 but the tailwind from is, is there in the existing order book is my understanding so can we expect this tailwind to continue for the next two or uh, two quarters yeah, yeah. So there will be there will be uh, some effect of that for the next two quarters it will start you know the effect will start tapering off but there will be an effect over the next week it will not be a steep uh, fall it will wind down gradually so that is enough yes any advice thank you so much thank you and all the best thank you the next question is from the line of mihir manohar from carnelian asset management please go ahead yeah uh, thanks for giving the opportunity and congratulations on a good set of numbers uh, sir just slightly wanted to understand on the uh, on the export side i mean given the fact we are seeing uh, some amount of slowdown the exports uh, just wanted to understand the profitability improvement which had happened right from 17000 uh, per metric ton to 58000 kind of a metric ton has started getting normalizing so just wanted to understand you know what was the profitability base uh, which was driven by higher uh, higher exports you know if you can throw some light as to what is the realization difference uh, in a uh, realization 
difference per metric ton uh, for US business and for domestic business uh, that will be really helpful. And just my second question was on the uh, competition side. I mean, last time you had mentioned that some of the Chinese suppliers uh, have uh, once again started to get entry, uh, especially in the US conductors business. Uh, so what is the stand as of now? I mean, you know, how is the Chinese part playing out uh, specifically on the US conductors? I uh, just wanted to understand that. Yes, yeah, so... Uh, you know, this 17,000 to 58,000 per metric ton is a combination of various things that has happened. Uh, you had all your tailwinds which includes this uh, your supply chain disruption that happened and China plus one happened and uh, then you have the renewable energy push uh, in the US and also, you know, I think yeah, also a lot of, you know, distributors wanting to just fill up their warehouses. So it's a combination of multiple things that has gone up and in addition to that, we had our own uh, premiumization that happened uh, within APA where we put uh, the premium conductors uh, there. So it's a really multiple combination and there's no one number that can be attributable to uh, you know what, what uh, actually increased. So that's the reason we are still guiding a 25,000 plus the tailwinds because we expect some of the tailwinds will definitely continue over next two, three quarters and some may even continue in perpetuity depends on you know the competition intensity and and China plus one strategy. The US is not, <clears throat> your second question was that uh, China plus one with respect to the US. So the Chinese players as I mentioned earlier also are not the biggest threat in the US market because the currently the uh, tariffs for Chinese products still remain higher than for Indian products. The competitive intens intensity of Chinese manufacturers is showing up in other geographies where they do not have any uh, differential tariffs and in some cases they actually have a more favorable tariff than Indian companies which are in certain Latin American uh, markets. So the Chinese competition has definitely increased but it's not in the US. It's in the United States, Australia, etc. kind of staying away from Chinese uh, suppliers. It's more in Europe, Latin America, etc. maybe in Africa where you know their uh, presence is being uh, felt today. Sure, sir, sure. Sir, just wanted to understand the realization difference for non-premium products. I mean, what is the realization difference for US and non-US and domestic market? So, you know, it's, it's, there's just so many orders and it's very difficult to pin any, uh, any such number. All I can say is that the strategy has been to take uh, standard products and sell them in uh, as much as possible in premium markets and take premium products and then sell them as much as possible in the domestic market, especially on the conductor side, by uh, selling a turnkey solution, uh, you know, for the HPL and ATC, etc. The copper products which are there, they are inherently uh, carrying uh, a higher margin and are more specific in their application. So, uh, you know, such a level of uh, granularity is something that, you know, we would not be able to provide. Sure, 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 sure. Understood. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Poojan Cha from Congru Congruence Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, only one, uh, not a clarification, but a question would be, uh, if we look at the specific uh, HEC component which has been decreased in the total mix, if we assume that the total mix would remain the same as the last quarter, would we get to achieve the same EBITDA per metric than what we have achieved in the last quarter? So the EBITDA depends on this HEC as well as exports. You know, so so uh, if you assume the same. on the level of execution over there. Okay. But if you assume the you same, know, would it be the... reduction in HEC, but uh, you know, you've got uh, HEC contributes towards some 20 odd percent of the total basket. So the remaining products also, it's a, it's a, it's a moving uh, mix which is uh, taking place. Okay. Okay. Uh, the ATC will be in the same in the same vicinity, plus or minus a few percent. Okay. And second question would be on the polymer business. So how much uh, uh, total capital we like to invest in this specific? Uh, for this year and the next year and uh, yes we are assuming that it will grow to 200-300 crores but uh, 
are we mainly focusing for like is it for the cable business so that the polymer can be used or it is being used for the uh, specific for the reason of the, the purpose of the sale so our investment will be in the tune of about 35 crores and part of it will be to grow the polymer business partly for the in house requirement for cable and also to sell those same uh, products outside our in house uh, requirement okay. Okay. other applications other than uh, for cable industry also okay got it thank you so much thank you the next question is from the line of aditya khandelwal from securities investment management please go ahead yeah hi sir thanks for the opportunity uh, i have a couple of questions regarding our oil business so if you could bifurcate the volume share of different products like transformer oil white oil and industrial process oils in other total volumes so you know we never given a guidance in terms of the exact breakup of uh, you know the transformer oil white oils etc but uh, we've given the details in terms of uh, you know uh, of the lubricant side of the business which uh, is at 241 crores and at about 17500 uh, kl kiloliters um, out of uh, a total of about uh, 135000 uh, kiloliters in total so sir, i just wanted a rough take off of the 130000 kl which we sold what would be the proportion of transformer oil like just a rough proportion So there, uh, transformer oil is yeah about a third, uh, yeah, about thirty thirty to thirty five percent, and white oil is uh, about thirty percent, twenty eight to thirty percent. Got it. And these uh, lubricants are forming about fifteen seventeen thousand five hundred out of one lakh thirty thousand. Got it. So sir, the thirteen percent year on year volume growth which we witnessed with lubricants uh, showing a flat growth and white oil being a slow growing segment. Would it be fair to say that we would have grown by more than 15% in the transformer oil segment? We we've had uh, a double digit growth in that quarter in transformer oil as well as in industrial uh, on the industrial lubricant side. Okay. So, but you know, I would see these businesses. It's difficult to uh, just take a quarter and you know, you, if you look really at a, you got to really look at 12-12 month periods to be able to you know make a call. Our general uh, sense is that transformer oil volumes will grow, given the amount of infrastructure on the power side that's growing, in not only in India but around the world. Sure, sir. So the lead, the lead product is one of the lead products will be transformer oil. Sure. And so I just wanted to you know, get a better understanding of the workings of industrial lubricant business. So are these products you know sold directly to the customers or they are sold through uh, distribution channels? And uh, are they sold primarily on price, or is there some element of branding also involved? So um, we larger accounts are sold by us directly. Uh, smaller accounts, we have an extensive uh, distribution setup because uh, industrial oil for some customers they would buy just one barrel or two barrels. So distributors take care of that. In terms of uh, performance, uh, branded and non-branded, you have. Uh, Fundamentally, multiple categories. So you know the performance products, uh, high performance products, and products which pr- you've got to sell along with the service are the two which are more sticky in nature. Uh, they either carry OEM approvals or um, you know they are much high performance um, uh, products where the lubrication requirement is uh, uh, you know is lubricating a machinery of very high value. So that segment is a branded segment. Then there is a all of it is branded, but uh, you may have hydraulic oils and some of these which are uh, you know which are less critical. Within hydraulics, also if you are running high injection molding machines and some of these more expensive equipments, then they would carry OEM approval. Got it. Thank you. That was it. Yeah. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Kashal Desai for his closing comments. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank all of you for uh, joining our uh, Q1 FY24 earnings call. 
Um, just in conclusion, I say that we've had a good start to FI24, um, and uh, we expect that you know all the long-term indicators, the medium and long-term indicators, remain intact. In the short term, uh, there could be um, some adjustments in demand in uh, a few export markets like the United States, but the domestic market remains uh, robust. And um, we continue to be uh, very optimistic of our uh, business in the uh, quarters and years to come. So once again, thank you very much for joining our call. Thank you, members of the management team. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Apar Industries Limited, that concludes this conference call. We thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you. Please subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another update. Please like, share and comment.